This video is brought to you by DistroKid. Get 7% off your first year with DistroKid using the link in the description. How is the recording studio changing? How are records being made today, and how will that change in the future? Our journey begins in Summerland, BC, on the west bank of the Okanagan Valley. Today, we'll discover what goes into making a quality microphone from Dave Thomas of Advanced Audio, Canada's only microphone manufacturer. Hi, I'm Dave Thomas from Advanced Audio Microphones, and you're watching Learn Audio Engineering. Thank you for having us here. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah, <laughs> a little smoky, but other than that, it's very beautiful. Yeah, that's the, the new norm for yeah. uh, the Okanagan in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Or Smokinagan is what they're calling it. Our interview series today is covering a topic about how the recording industry is changing. So one of the first questions that we wanted to ask you is about um, your first studio, Ocean Sound, was opened in the 70s in Vancouver. And we wanted to know how has the recording studio changed since then? Physically, the studio, you know, has changed because now people are recording in the computers. 71 was the very first kind of professional recording where we actually made a record out of, we recorded a live jazz radio show from uh, Puccini's uh, restaurant in Vancouver. And we recorded that to four tracks. We had a four track tape machine. And that's how I got the gig because I had a four track and a little mixer I'd built. I knew the, the executive engineer and I knew Ralph Dyke really well. I'd repaired some gear for him. They uh, trusted us to be able to record this live jazz show with a, just a handful of microphones that we had at the time. And part of that series of recordings got it turned into a record called Live at Puccini's which a guy named Laurie Wallace. He got too busy to mix the radio shows, so we actually built a little studio in a double car garage in North Vancouver, and primarily we were just mixing this radio show once a week. Between 1971 and 1978, we went from a four-track tape machine to an eight-track to a 16-track, and then finally to a 24-track studer. So that it was a pretty quick progression yes, of, yeah. of technology. And then by the 80s, people were starting to experiment in getting into the digital domain. And when we recorded Jupiter 8, which was Ralph Dyke again, but with Paul Horn, the famous jazz flute player, that was recorded to 24 track, but we mixed it to digital. And But even then, we had to store the digital medium on something. And so we chose Beta because that was the better than VHS. And, and of course, Beta went the way of the dodo bird. So yeah. <laughs> I doubt if you could ever play those, those digital masters back again. And that was the point where Ralph was working with Roland in Japan, and he came up with the Roland microcomposer. So it was the first computer that was playing uh, polyphonic music, like he could play, have it play eight notes at once. The first, uh, and, and everything, uh, there's a video I think I gave you a clip to of us in the studio recording Jupiter 8, and you can see Ralph punching numbers into, which it looks like a standard keyboard today, you know, or adding machine, sort of a bit keyboard, and he's punching numbers in. And those are all the numbers MIDI uses today for note length, for timing, for volume changes. A lot of what he developed became MIDI, you know, that was the... That was, you know, about 1983 when we finished that record. And I think by the late 80s, we were actually recording into an, an eight-channel uh, DAW system for doing dialogue replacement. And this is right when Pro Tools first came out, and they were, I forget what they were called. They had, they had some other name for it. But a lot of how the DAWs work, because you see time going from left to right, that was all stuff that Ralph developed. He developed the basic platform for digital recording and, and MIDI recording. We found out that you helped Led Zeppelin in their first show in Vancouver fix an amplifier problem. Could you tell us how you did that? Oh, well, it was, yeah, that was December 1969, and Zeppelin had played Denver, Colorado, and Seattle with rented amplifiers. And their marshals they'd picked out when they went back to England arrived in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and we were contracted to provide backline. I think we provided the Leslie speaker for John Paul Jones' Hammond and extra uh, PA speakers because they'd suddenly they they broken out so they when they started the tour I think they were playing you know 5,000 seat arenas and now they're playing 15,000 seat arenas so they needed more more sound gear so when the marshals arrived I remember the roadie coming to me and saying where do I plug these in and I went 
Not in this country, mate. Those have got British plugs and they're wired for 220. So Alex and I took them apart and changed the tap on the power transformer and then put North American plugs on them. And we worked through our lunch to do that. And that's when I first met my wife and we've been married since, you know, since 71. She went out to McDonald's and got us hamburgers. <laughs> and w when Robert Plant came for the sound check, went to grab one of the hamburgers and she slapped his wrist and said, those are for the guys that work through their lunch to fix your amplifiers. And um, <laughs> so I was telling this to my friend Paul Rogers and he said, oh man, I got to tell Jimmy that story. He'll love that story. He said, if, if Jimmy ever comes to visit or we're close by, I'll let you know. And Jimmy will probably buy you lunch to hear that story. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we got their amps, you know, so they had the North American plugs on and they worked for the rest of the tour. That was it. But that was, you know, that was 1969. There was no internet, so people didn't know unless you'd been to Canada or North America that it was 120 volts, not 220. How did you know how to do that? Well, because I was a tech at a music, st you know, that's what I did during the week was fix guitar amps. Like I had a ham radio license when I was 14. I was always playing around with electronics. And that's what I discovered. I always wanted to play a musical instrument. And, and I stupidly thought, well, I'll learn to play drums because you just have to hit things. <laughs> well, that's not exactly... So I found out right away that I was much better at mixing the sound and keeping the guitar amps working and, you know, fixing all the gear. We should write a song for Distro Kid. Why? They're the fastest way to get music onto streaming services, and with Distro Kid splits, you and I can share all the money we make. What do you mean? With Distro Kid, it's easy to add songwriters onto each release to make sure everyone involved with the collaboration gets paid. So if I write the lyrics, I get 50%. Everyone gets a slice of the pie, and you decide how it's cut. That sounds pretty good. One problem. Okay. Have you ever written a jingle before? No. Use the link below to get 7% off your first year with DistroKid today. This is the first year where I've actually been working on a recording where tracks came to me from different places. Right. Like files are coming to me and because of COVID, the, uh, the songwriter can't leave Chicago to come to Canada. So he sent me his guitar parts and a click track and guy vocals. So we're sending files to him so he can listen to, you know, rough mixes and so it's the first time where I'm actually working in the box. There's some things about it I really like. What I don't like is mousing around. And I'm working in a laptop because the laptop's faster than the, the old um, iMac we're using. Do you think that it has changed what it means to make a good record? The better the players, especially when you're getting tracks from somebody, you completely have to trust the musician who's giving you the tracks, you know. So you've got to, you know, trust that he's going to actually listen. And so you need very, very good players, the same kind of players that you would have back in the day. But what we had to do is we, we had everybody playing together. So what you got was, you know, the keyboard player going, well, it's kind of muddy and I'm going to move um, the chords version up higher and get them out of the mids or whatever. You, you had guys working that kind of stuff out. The technology, on the other hand, you can use that technology to fix pitch. You can um, fix timing. You know, you're going to spend a lot of time, but you can take somebody who doesn't have the studio experience and you can get something that's record quality. I don't like to use it to fix things that aren't, you know, I'd rather get it right. But it really does have its uses and I, I think that it's like a, any tool, you can use it to enhance the recording. When you have a player that plays it right, you know, it, that that's just magical. Was it your background in electronics that drove you to start Advanced Audio? Because I was the tech at the studio, so I designed Ocean Sound and wired it. You know, I would fix all the gear as well as do some recording sessions. So I had to fix all the microphones, and we had two original U47 microphones. And so I had to service them. And what happened, I got out of the studio business in the 90s, but what I missed the most was live recording. I love recording live jazz, like where you capture a performance that's never ever going to happen again. Like, it's going to be close, they might play the same song, but mm -hmm. they, the way they improvise, you know, like there's always something magical that's going to happen. And I loved 
doing that. So I wanted some microphones to go out and do some live recording, and I couldn't afford the Neumanns. Somebody brought me a Chinese tube microphone, an Apex 460, through Long McQuaid Music. And he said, what do you think of this mic? And I said, well, it has a tube in it, and it, and it sounds like a microphone, but it doesn't quite sound like the Neumanns did. And then I drew out the circuit and I went, oh, well, there's a flaw here. And then that's the wrong tube. They couldn't get those tubes in China, right? They they build some stuff for us, metalwork and circuit boards for us, but they build the circuit boards to my design and we send them the tubes. I turned that microphone into a basically a C12. And then I went and did some live recording with it. I took them on with my friend Paul Baker's and he went, wow, those mics you brought over, those sound awesome. Can you leave them with me? And I said, Sure, Paul. I don't need them for a couple of weeks. I'm going to record a choir, but a few days before the live recording, I said, hey, I got to come and get my mics. He said, you're not getting them. I'm buying them from you. <laughs> and so I had to go along with Quaid and buy another and, and quickly build up another couple mm -hmm. to do this live recording. And so that's kind of how Advanced Audio started. Like Paul would call me and say, hey, somebody came in and cut a vocal and uh, they want to buy one of your mics. Can you build up another one? Then I finally got hold of the guys in Shanghai that built these mics. So I said, yeah, but can you change? I want to use these capsules that you make for John Paluzzo and I want this head grill on there and I, I want to change the circuit to do this and send them the, the diagrams. And they would kept saying, that would be more money, more money. And I Finally, after 10 days, two weeks, they said, $50 more a microphone. And I went, okay, just do it. <laughs> and so that's our first model. And so we kind of went from there. And I basically just went after all the microphones we used in the studio. You know, like the 414s are really lovely workhorses, the EBs. They were the favorite on the piano and over top of the drums. And, and trying to not just clone them part for part, but actually improve some of the things about them that you can do today that you couldn't do back in the 60s. Like the power supplies are now regulated. The voltage won't move more than 2%, no matter how much the line voltage changes. If you look at a, a, a U47, I have one on the workbench, it takes 50 minutes for that power supply to finally get up to the right voltage and stay stable. So you always had to Please. Turn those microphones <laughs> on an hour before mm -hmm. you were ready to record. So now it takes two minutes. The power supplies are up to voltage and the, the tubes are heated up and ready to go within two minutes. You know, so you don't have to turn them on. They, they're more stable over time. And the components today, you know, we're getting resistors that are 1% tolerance, where back in the day in the 60s, 20% was the average. And if you had a 10% tolerance, that was like, whoa, that was, you know, hi-fi. What is tolerance? Tolerance, how much one component varies to the other. Oh, okay. So if, if something measures 100, then 1% tolerance, it'll be 99 or 101. But if it was a 20% tolerance, then it would be 80 or mm -hmm. 120. Right. Could be the variation. Mm -hmm. you know? So things are a lot more exact yeah. these days. Yeah, so the circuits don't vary. You can, mm -hmm. you can one mic to the next, whatever circuit components, the only variation you're going to get is in the capsule. Okay. Because they're handmade, so, you know, they have to be hand tensioned, and so they will vary a little bit from one to the other. This one was 1958, so after nearly 50 years, there's only about four threads holding this on the stand. Right. Like all the threads are just worn away in the aluminum, so. But if this is my mic, what I do is I undo this, this wing nut completely and uh, not mount it on here and use use this mount. This is my mount. Right, so, so this is the mount that comes with with our uh, 47LE. This mic belongs to Paul Johnston. He's the head of recording at McEwen University and we'll be interviewing him in episode three. Some pretty old stuff. I mean, here's ours. You know, that's uh, a little more modern tube and, you know, in the socket in there. But that's all the components, not many components on there. Right? I had a few questions of my own, so I met up with Dave at his home studio to see how he set up his space for recording and mixing. With all these different choices for microphones these days, what would you say is the best way to compare the sound of two microphones? Well, you have to compare them with the same sound source, you know, so you need them, they need to be in the same vertical and, and horizontal plane, you know, so the sound is hitting both the diaphragms at the same time. I just put them and then we just listen to the two and see. It, interestingly, sometimes you'll, you'll pick one and you go, oh, I like the sound of that one, but when you put it in the track, the other one works. Yeah. 
it's all about context. It, yeah, it's, it's it's all about what other things are in that frequency range. Mm -hmm. Very famous engineer Al Schmidt, who just passed away, recorded Toto and all Diana Krall's albums, and he put microphones where they sounded best to his ear. Mm -hmm. So you always listen to the. You know, I've seen guys mic up a drum kit and never listen to the drum yeah. kit. Like, I've seen them, like, mic the toms, the bottom and the top of toms and the whole kit. And I actually heard the demo to this one song, and I said, he's not playing any tom fills in this song, is he? <laughs> and, they, and he went, uh, I said, why are you miking all the toms? Like, just get rid of them. Take them away. Yeah, take them away. Because from... they're going to rattle and re res. Take them away from the kit, yeah. <laughs> With home recording being so prominent these days, what would you say is your best home treatment tip? Get rid of parallel reflective walls. Yeah. yeah what, what you see in this room is I've actually turned the room around on its, this is a corner. That's yeah. the corner to the room and that's the corner in the back. So that's the longest dimension mm -hmm. yeah. in this room. So we put the bass trap right in the back okay. and then we've diffused this with kind of a, yeah. a home built QRD. Yeah. You know, the dimensions, the depth uh -huh. is uh -huh. the important thing. It just it diffuses the reflections mm -hmm. evenly across the mid-range. So there's no par real parallel walls here. And what we try to do is I've tried to treat them. I'm going to do a bit more treatment in this room. When you build a, a panel, um, you want to have it four inches thick. You know, just putting foam on the wall will kill the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. But but it's the mid-range where the fundamentals are, like A440. You know, that stuff is where all the muck is. Yeah. So you want to grab that, you know, and, and you want to get the initial with the microphone, but you don't want to get a lot of that bouncing around the room. So panels, just a piece of cloth with sound insulation behind it. Do some bass trapping. That's 24 inches deep, those traps back there. And, and if you, uh, well, you won't see it because I'm off camera, but, but you, when you hit them, you'll hear them go boom. Like the, you can, it's like a drum, yeah. Yeah, it's basically a drum. It's, it's just the, the low frequencies and, and holding them in. And then the other panels are all four, four inches deep. So. Well, thanks so much for showing us your studio yeah. and oh, for, around the workshop and everything. I think we've got one more surprise for you before we go. We challenged Dave to assemble a mic of his choice blindfolded, and here's what happened. This is the 67 yeah. I'm with. Advanced audio microphone. So, you know, to, to be able to work on these mics, we want them to be um, easily repairable. And, you you know, you don't need a screwdriver to take them apart. Um, and so what you can see is that even blindfolded, I'm able to put this microphone back together again. If I can just find the, the bottom, there it is. Um, so that's, that's how quickly you can get access to change the tube, uh, get at the components that you, uh, you know, you, you'll never do that with a Neumann, be able to take it apart and put it back together blindfolded. <laughs> I've learned so much, but I still have more questions. To answer them, we need to go to the hollow ground of the first mobile recording interface. So join me next time where we go to Calgary to get our hands on the Rolling Stones mobile studio. Thanks for watching and subscribe to Learn Audio Engineering.